first, I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for attending uh, from wherever you may be. Uh, I know some of you it's morning, evening, afternoon, night, um, but uh, we greatly appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day to attend. Um, as Sean said, my name is Jeff Bonkowski. Um, I was a career firefighter, currently retired. Um, I trained to the level of a hazmat specialist. I was a paramedic and a toxmatic and, and ran some hazmat teams within the state of Michigan. And I've got like over 30 years of experience. And after retiring, I started doing consulting work with ethanol industry, which was one of the high hazards and it was becoming the number one commodity shipped by rail. And in the process of looking for a solution um, for those high hazard fires or those types of fires, it led me to hazard control technologies and um, what I'm going to talk to you about today, encapsulator agent. Um, and again, all the different uses and, and the different classes of fires. So I hope that uh, this is uh, informative and gives you some insight and in how uh, it can be very beneficial in using um, as we talk, discuss uh, and talk about our um, auto accidents and, and, and things along the highways. So to get started, um, it's Hazard Control's technology's mission to, as we say, encapsulate the world. We wanna make it a safer place. Um, so through uh, fire prevention, protection, um, specialized suppression, and the use of our eco-friendly uh, innovative encapsulator technology, we hope that uh, we can sit there and we can provide that extra oh, yeah. protection that uh, <clears throat> service we're looking for. Um, and again, when I was doing my consulting work, my goal is the same as HCTs, trying to make firefighting a safer profession. We are a global company uh, based out of Fayetteville, Georgia. Um, we've been in business since 1997. Um, and like I say, we've got distribution throughout, uh, throughout the world. So the objectives today is hopefully getting you to have a better understanding of an encapsulator agent, um, how it improves the efficiency of water, add safety, especially when we're dealing with some of our roadside accidents and some of the calls that we get called to. And we're going to be talking about a spherical micelle, and I hope to give you a better understanding and uh, a a definition of just exactly what that spherical micelle is. Um, and we'll talk about the F500 encapsulator technology and how it interacts with all four legs of the fire tetrahedron, um, which can be especially important when we're dealing with our auto accidents because we have multi classes of fires that we're dealing with and identify the percentages. Um, because again, the, based on the classifier, uh, we don't want you wasting the product uh, so that it's not cost effective. So to start with, you know, let's start to talk about what is an encapsulator agent. And right now, we in all of our trade magazines and, and publications and things that we read about fluorinated ingredients in foam, um, the hazards being a carcinogen, a forever chemical. Um, F500 has none of that. We've had the product tested to EPA 537 a standard, which tests for 25 different fluorinated ingredients. And the results came back that we had zero of the fluorinated ingredients tested for. Um, it's a multi-class uh, CULUS NFPA listed fire protection uh, suppression agent, and then combustible flammable vapor and liquid spill control. One of the things I like to point out, though, is when you sit there and, and, you know, when I'm doing my presentations, I like to ask the question when I show this slide is, can anybody in the fire service name for me another agent that can work and help take care of flammable vapors? Um, most cases, I get some blank looks, but just something to think about. And we'll talk as we go through here about encapsulator agents and their abilities to uh, work on vapors as well as the liquids. So when we get into the definition of uh, the encapsulator agent, again, the basing building block is going to be that spherical micelle. We'll talk about those um, spherical micelles in depth as we go through the program. And to give you an understanding of it, we'll see a video, but right now the spherical micelles are capable of encapsulating um, 
carbon molecules, both polar and nonpolar, um, the hydrocarbon vapors, as well as the liquid molecules. So it's, it's a very uh, unique uh, agent and being able to encapsulate many different uh, properties that we deal with when we respond to our fires. So when we sit there, we look at it, we're, when we, we talk about foams, foams create that separation, okay? Well, an encapsulator right, separates the fuel from the oxygen. We don't cause a blanket to cause a separation. We're actually working on a chemical molecular level. So totally different in how we react. And to give you a better understanding, let's start with a video that shows you. Encapsulator technology. The next generation. I'm going to stop that for a minute because for some reason I'm getting some interference. I'm not sure from where. And there we go. Technology. The next generation of fire and hazard mitigation. First, we start with a simplified version of a single encapsulator agent molecule consisting of a hydrophilic polar head, which loves water, dissolves in water, and a hydrophobic nonpolar tail, which fears water, will do anything to get away from water. Once the E8 molecules enter the water, they instantaneously and automatically orient the nonpolar tails inward and the polar heads outward, forming millions of spherical micelles. Micelles travel towards and exit the nozzles, forming E8 droplets. Micelles nearest to the surface of each droplet automatically break apart. The nonpolar tails orient outside the droplet, with polar heads on the surface, forming an EA skin on the surface of every droplet. In addition to the EA skin, there are millions of molecular spherical micelles within each droplet. So as you can see, when we are introduced into the water stream, we're chemically changing the makeup of a water droplet. One, we're putting a skin on the surface, so it's no longer truly water that's coming in contact with uh, many of the uh, agents or many of the things that we're trying to extinguish. And yet there are still millions and millions of those spherical micelles inside of each and every droplet that are doing the encapsulation for us. So it's very important that you know to, you understand the uh, how these work. So when we start looking at an encapsulator agent, um, as we go through this presentation, we're going to go back and think about our fire chemistry when we basically started into fire academy. You know, we learned back when I was there it was a triangle, now it's a tetrahedron. But if you remove any one of the legs of the triangle. You've, you've extinguished the fire. Um, and we're gonna show you how we're able to encapsulate the fuel, how we're able to eliminate, reduce the heat, how we're able to interfere with that chemical chain reaction where all the soot, the carcinogens and the toxins are formed and how we're able to improve air quality um, when we sit there and start using an encapsulator agent when we fight these fires. When we talk about our accidents today, the nature of the beast is changing daily. Um, I mean, we're getting from gas powered cars to hybrid vehicles, to, you know, lithium ion battery powered vehicles, and it's, it's, it's constantly changing. Um, so we're going to discuss and talk about, like say, lithium ion batteries, your class D metals, your flammable liquids and fuels. And as they say, oh my, what else might be coming down the road? As we sit there, we start to look and some of the statistics here in the United States alone, the number of deaths for the first nine months of 2021, they have them estimated to be somewhere in the air about 33,000, 34,000 um, so far, um, just in the first nine months. And it, the results are up 10% compared to 2020. But when we go back to 19 uh, or 2019, it's up 17%. And some of the other things that we are learning um, is that your our automakers, uh, Ford, General Motors, and others, you know, they're making pledges that they're going to increase the number of electric vehicles that they manufacture, hoping to have half of their fleet by 2030, um, all electric and 
pretty much everything are eliminating gas vehicles by 2035. So there's going to be a major shift in the coming years in the number of these electric vehicles, these hybrid vehicles that we're going to be seeing on the roadways. And, you know, as we keep hearing, um, the difficulties of extinguishing lithium ion batteries and some of these batteries, and the technology is constantly changing. So when we sit there and start looking at our vehicles today, let's look at the classes of fires that we're dealing with. And, you know, there's many of them. It's not just, a, you know, a fuel fire and, and, and some class A, some plastic and things like that. Uh, we're dealing with multiple classes, class A, your seats, uh, your interior, your plastics, your class B, your class D. Um, and then again, lithium ion batteries, as I've mentioned. Um, we look at the class A materials, again, tires, the cloth seats, um, the toxins, the plastics, all things that, you know, give off those carcinogens and those toxins that are causing our cancer rates in the fire service to be increased. And again, we're learning now with fluorinated foams and having the toxicity being exposed to some of those if we're using it on, uh, on our uh, vehicle fires. So when we look at the class B materials, again, you know, we have our auto accidents where we have fuel spills, oil, um, you know, transmission fluid, if the radiator's been damaged. But it's not only with cars, but, you know, we have to look at tanker trucks. I mean, I mean a lot of us respond to uh, accidents involving um, tractor trailers and fuel tanks get ruptured. It doesn't necessarily have to be a tanker truck. You know, a lot of our uh, tank, our semis today carry, you know, what, 150 to 300 gallons of fuel, um, which is quite a bit. Um, and again, if we have to start working on extrication, what is your current method? to make that scene safe um, if you're doing an extrication with fuel and, and oils and things on the ground. Our class D metals, in an effort to make vehicles lighter, but yet maintain the strength, auto manufacturers are relying more and more on parts that are lightweight and made out of magnesium or titanium or other, other high strength metals. Um, I was doing some reading and on an average vehicle, there's somewhere in the area of about 350 pounds of magnesium parts on a vehicle. Um, it's, it's not just in the steering column, but you know, you're looking at some suspension parts, um, engine parts, dash parts, uh, those center consoles in our vehicles, many different pieces or parts to the vehicles are be, being made out of these lighter weight uh, materials because they offer great strength and again in, in trying to make these vehicles lighter um, if you look at uh, some of our new uh, Ford aluminum body F-150s there's uh, amazing amounts of magnesium as far as cross members and I believe even the radiator support um, but uh, they're just a, a great number of parts that are made with magnesium and, and they're constantly growing. Uh, I know some magnesium companies that used to make alloy parts um, that have now converted all to magnesium because the number of parts that they're going to be making out of uh, magnesium is growing. So when we sit there and we look, I wanna show you uh, this video, um, it's a car fire that involves magnesium. One of the things I want to point out is as he's going through, you can see they've added to the fire load. Um, they've used uh, a lot of times they'll put diesel fuel or some type of a fuel, an accelerant um, that they'll add to help to get the fire started. Uh, but then they put some other things in there to increase the fire load. As you notice, as he's going through, um, he keeps adjusting a spray pattern. He's trying to do multiple things, cool the metal, extinguish the fire. Um, and we'll see some other videos as we go through. Actually, uh, we have a, a video with a car fire with thermal imaging that's really uh, pretty impressive. As he comes around to this other side, uh, this is a video I like to show 
for the simple reason as he sits there and he hits the steering column, you're going to see a brief flash, okay? He's broken the crust on the surface as that magnesium burns. It has a tendency to form a crust. Um, when he hit it with the um, F500 spray, he broke that crust, exposed it to air, and he had a flash. As you notice, it wasn't an explosion. You know, nothing flew out of the car. Nothing flew up in the air or towards him. It was just, a, like I say, just a little bright flash, and, and the encapsulator agent was able to um, start cooling and uh, extinguishing. One of the other things I point out is you see some magnesium yet on the uh, floorboard. Um, as he sits there and he fills up that floorboard with the F500 solution, even though it's becoming submerged in um, F500 solution, there's still no explosion. Um, you might see it bubble. So you might, uh, you know, see see it as it's cooling, um, but there won't there won't be there won't be an extinguishment, uh, or there won't be a, a, a mag fire or explosion. And the reason why when we use water, we see those explosions with magnesium is because of the temperatures that magnesium burns at. Magnesium burns in excess of four, five, 6,000 degrees, and it causes water molecules to separate into their two properties, hydrogen and oxygen. And I ask the question, what did we use to send rockets to the moon with? So we're creating an explosive atmosphere and the magnesium is still hot enough. So we get those explosions. We got another uh, video here. Again, um, a car fire. This is at a demo. Uh, first time they probably had an experience using uh, encapsulator agent. And one of the things that you can see is, like I say, as he's going through making um, his extinguishment, he's doing a couple things. Um, he's working to cool the metal. He's working to extinguish. If you watch black smoke turning white, we're encapsulating those soots and the toxins that are being released, uh, reducing the, the carcinogens that uh, would be exposed to normally. Again, uh, magnesium you'll see on the steering column. So what he's doing now, it's a, a TKO nozzle our turbo knockdown nozzle, which uh, will have various uh, uh, percentages from a half, one to three. Um, because of the mag, he's gone ahead and switched it up to 3%. Uh, one thing that we want to caution, and he did make the change, as you notice when he was first starting to hit that, he had it at a, uh, a relatively straight stream. Um, you want to caution uh, when you are attacking to stay away from that straight stream pattern. Um, you want to go in and, and rain it down and do a subtle um, uh, to, to start getting some cooling of the magnesium before you get it. Um, but like I say, the magnesium is, uh, is able to be extinguished and cooled because we put that skin on the surface. So if we think back to the video showing how when we introduce encapsulator agent in to the water stream, we're doing it. And as you can see on the floorboard there, you could see some of that that bubbling taking place. Um, let me back it up here a little bit. You, you'll see that bubbling taking place because that magnesium has been has been um, submerged under the solution. Again, no explosion um, when that happens. So our next thing we're going to talk about in the, in our fire classes is our lithium ion batteries, you know, our hybrid vehicles, our Teslas, and, and, you know, we have what Ford's coming out with an electric truck and they've got a hybrid smaller vehicle, which is a Maverick and, you know, General Motors and all the different auto companies are coming out with these. But we always, when we start talking about, you know, our lithium ion vehicles, we all suddenly think of cars. But technology is also starting to include trucks and buses, not only buses that run up and down our streets, um, you know, to pick up the passengers and, and get them to work. Or, or, but right now, you've got even you have school bus manufacturers that are starting to manufacture school buses that will be running on lithium ion batteries. So it's not just the auto manufacturers that are trying to get away from the gasoline engines. OK, it's pretty much. Any vehicle that's going to be traveling our roads 
are one day going to end up being an electric vehicle. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be uh, growing exponentially over the next few years. This is a, a deadly crash involving one of Tesla's cars with an autopilot feature. The car slammed into a tree and burst into flames. Police tell ABC News it appears no one was in the driver's seat. Here's ABC's Gio Benitez. Tonight, mystery surrounding a deadly crash near Houston involving a Tesla Model S. The charred wreckage captured on camera after it crashed into a tree and burst into flames. Two men inside were killed. The Tesla's high energy battery reigniting over and over again. Firefighters trying to put the fire out for four hours with more than 30,000 gallons of water. The fire eventually put itself out. Now tonight, the question, was the Tesla running on autopilot? Okay, so four hours and 30,000 gallons of water. I mean, I read a lot of articles and, and I'm sure some of you have out there as well. Um, where the rule is, is use water, you'll need copious amounts. Well, I always kind of get leery when I hear copious amounts because how much is a copious amount? And here we have an example. One vehicle, 30,000 gallons of water, four hours. Basically, the vehicle burned itself out. What they did is they had, and in reading and looking at this, they knocked the fire down rather rapidly initially the problem was is they weren't able to cool the batteries down and stop thermal runaway so they had reignition the other thing i want to point out is if you sit there and you start looking at the makeup of a lithium-ion battery and all the hazards that they present where did that thirty thousand gallons of water run off to how much did it contaminate you say so we have to look at all aspects of this because again people are becoming more and more conscious of the environment and what firefighters are doing you know just like with the fluorinated foams okay where we have to now be a little bit more cautious in how we use them and where we use them uh, we're going to have the same things with lithium-ion batteries as we look to the future when people start to realize that you know hey this runoff is causing an environmental issue if it gets into the groundwater okay we can't afford to continue to use 30,000 gallons of water if you go out west where they're experiencing drought conditions they don't have 30,000 gallons of water that they can afford to use on one car fire um, here's another example uh, with the car fire it's um, this particular ve vehicle took 35 firefighters and five trucks one of the reasons why is because the water source, okay, while I go to many fire departments and communities and, you know, I get the, the old, oh, hey, we have fire hydrants, we have all the water we need, uh, water's free. Well, how many of you have extinct fire hydrants on the expressway? Or in, in, if, you, if you're an area where, you know, you have some rural uh, communities that you do mutual aid with. Uh, again, you don't have the luxury of, of water. Um, but again, you know, this is a relatively long video uh, showing uh, the traffic backup. Okay. You know, your exposure um, in some instances, if you're not able to block traffic 100% all the way, um, you're exposing firefighters to distracted drivers. Um, and I know on an annual basis, there's many firefighters. I read about on a, on a yearly basis that are killed by distracted drivers. Um, we're approaching in, in the, here in, in, in the U.S. The winter time uh, where we're going to have icy road conditions and again, auto accidents and, and things like that. And as we respond out there uh, and we start using our water, again, 30,000 gallons of water on a day when it's, you know, 28 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. What do you think that's going to do? Uh, you know, we're, we're going to be freezing up and creating a huge traffic uh, situation if we're starting to, to use water in these cold conditions. So, like I say, these are new hazards that, you know, we're going to keep being faced with. Uh, and, and I want to try to, as we said at the very beginning, you know, our goal is to make firefighting a safer prof uh, profession. 
and keeping people off the road and away from these distracted drivers is a way to do it. So when we sit there and we start looking now and we talk about, you know, NFPA, you know, and some of the things that go on, uh, the question comes up, how would your department approach a lithium ion battery fire or a solar panel? Or how about a solar panel that charges lithium ion batteries? There's many different situations that we can be dealing with. When we sit there, we start looking at our lithium ion batteries, you know, we see that, you know, how easily they can fail. We see the, we see the amount of smoke um, that's being released. Uh, that's not just smoke. Um, a lot of these lithium ion batteries, the way they're made, because of the electrolytes that they use, the gas being released is HF gas, hydrofluoric gas, um, which can be uh, deadly. Uh, it, it attacks, it, you know, attacks calcium in your body. And here we have, you know, a laptop that was just sitting there charging. Again, we have no idea if it was dropped or what type of abuse. It may not have had any abuse, but we can see just how violently um, these batteries can. Um, fail and create situations of house fires. And while, you know, we're showing this sitting on a table, how about your cell phone sitting in your car um, on a hot day? Maybe, you know, we left it, you know, we said we were doing something, uh, uh, going uh, to the beach, maybe swimming or whatnot. And instead of bringing the car or at the pool, and instead of bringing it, you leave your phone in the car sitting there and maybe we forget to cover it and it overheats. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a scooter or, or a laptop. It could be your cell phone in your car. So all different things we need to think about with these batteries. Uh, this video is going to show some comparative testing um, because when we sit there and we currently look at the technology that we're familiar with, um, we know that it's a copious amount of water, um, but then if we look at all of our buildings, you know, our warehouses, our schools, our, our stores, what's the extinguisher that's required for these occupancies? And they're usually an ABC, a powder. And as you can see, if we're dealing with a lithium ion battery um, at, uh, let's say, you know, the hardware store, power tools, powders don't work. Um, they might ex temporarily extinguish the fire, um, but they're not going to keep it out because they're going to do nothing to be able to um, stop the thermal runaway. When you look in the middle, I'm gonna back it up here just for a second here. We look in the middle of the foam, um, when they start applying the foam, it just seems to aggravate the fire. It really doesn't do much uh, to be able to put it out. And then it, when you sit there and look at F500, he's using just short little burst. He's not using a constant spray. <coughs> he's using a short little burst. This video was done in conjunction with HCT Europe and Johnson Controls. It was done at Kiwa Labs in the Netherlands. And um, the results were that uh, when they had got all done, this is right from uh, Johnson Controls results. Uh, the powders were poor and the remarks are, do not apply on lithium ion batteries. When we looked at foam, they gave it moderate to poor, but again, in the remarks, not recommended for use on lithium ion batteries. When we look at F500, they gave it sufficient and recommended on lithium ion batteries. In fact, over in Europe, they're even selling uh, extinguishers um, with F500 in it and have literature and brochures that state the only thing that can stop thermal runaway and extinguish a lithium ion battery is F500. So it's a very versatile um, extinguishing agent. So when we sit there, we start looking at, you know, our average responses, you know, the results are, you know, somewhere in the area about 1,200 or 12,200 uh, roadway responses occur every day in the United States. Um, and, you know, it, it, 
we don't know what materials are involved, um, you know, or fuels. We have many different hazards that are running up and down our roadways. And, you know, we can sit there and with an encapsulator agent, we can help deal with so many of them um, and increase the safety. The biggest thing is, is if we can get out there and we can start reducing the exposures to some of the toxics that are being released when these cars are burning, when the batteries are burning, um, if instead of having to use 30,000 gallons of water, uh, we can use much less, you know, possibly a thousand gallons or less on a lithium ion, a hundred gallons or less on a, uh, on a traditional car fire. Um, being able to encapsulate the HF gases being released, being able to encapsulate the toxins that are being released when we sit there and start looking at the fuels and the, and the plastics in, in our normal cars. But not only that, if we're needing less water to extinguish these car fires, what do you think that's going to do for our time on the roadways? Okay, if we have a tractor trailer fire, and I've, you know, had a department tell me that, you know, hey, we had this fire and, you know, we used 2,000 gallons of water on it and we weren't able to put it out. And we had our, our heavy rescue come because it had uh, F500 on it and with 300 gallons of water, we put it out. And it's, it's like, well, that's impressive. What 2,000 gallons of water couldn't extinguish with 300 gallons of water with F500 in the, in the solution, they were able to extinguish it. So again, much less water. If they had used that on right off the get-go, 300 gallons of water, they would have been packing up and they would have been back at the station before the heavy rescue even arrived. Um, so some of the things that we need to think about with our injuries and our losses, firefighters. Again, I'm going to talk about, you know, these icy conditions that we're going to be uh, experiencing here shortly. But, you know, we want to reduce and, and, and hopefully reduce our exposure to um, not only our seasoned firefighters, but our rookies. Because many times, you know, when we have a car fire, hey, let's put the rookie on the line, let them get a little practice uh, using the hose and, and get a little nozzle practice. Um, if we're sitting there, if we're using foams, again, you know, we're exposing ourselves to those forever chemicals. And when we sit there, we start looking at the encapsulator agent and how we're changing the chemical makeup of the water and how we have that effect of being able to reduce those toxins and, and all the things that uh, we currently are exposing ourselves to that are causing cancer within the fire service. Um, it, it's, it's uh, I guess you can say, disheartening to know that here we have a product that can uh, help keep firefighters safe and you know we have such a hard time trying to uh, get it out there and, and get, get people to understand all the uses and, and the value of using it so when we sit there we start talking again you know we don't need when i showed that one video 35 firefighters and five trucks you know, we're not going to need the, that number of personnel. Um, so we can, again, by not needing as many people on a call, we're reducing the exposure. If we don't need all those trucks on scene, we're reducing the wear and the tear and the maintenance and, and the cost associated with having to maintain those vehicles because we don't need to run them as often. We're going to be using less water. Not only that, then we have less water runoff. You know, we have less environmental impact uh, that we have when we're sitting there and using our Class B foams currently. And then all of the fees that are associated um, with those uh, cleanup costs. So when we sit there and we look at the unique features of an encapsulator agent and how it's able to uh, render fuels and, and things um, non-flammable, not ignitable, we look at the NFPA standard, which an encapsulator agent falls under. And in section 7.7, you are, you, you'll you read um, the spherical myocell stability test. Um, very important test. It makes sure that uh, those spherical myocells are working. Um, that test is we take a gallon of gasoline. We take 16 ounces of an encapsulator agent and five gallons of water. 
Once that's mixed into the solution, um, it's allowed to sit for one minute and that torch is passed across the surface of the pan. There can be no ignition. Then after two hours, at, at, after the, the initial test with the torch, it sits for two hours. And if it were foam, the foam blanket would break down, expose the fuel. And if you put a torch to it, it would ignite with encapsulator agent after two hours because we've encapsulated the fuel. You can pass the torch across the top of the, and the surface and there will still be no ignition. And I will say that it will go much longer than the two hours. Again, we're going to go through here another little car fire. Some of the things that I want to point out, and I kind of mixed again, this is a good one to see that black smoke quickly turning white. Um, you're going to watch as he's you know, going in, how quickly um, he's able to get that knocked down and extinguishment. But that black smoke turning white, those toxins, the interruption of the, those free radical coalescence um, that we talked about at the beginning, those free radicals. Okay, we're interfering with that process where those carcinogens are formed. When he's sitting there and he's going through, look how little water he's used. Look how little water is around the vehicle. Um, again, when we sit there and I, I talk about cold weather, um, what do you think that's going to do as far as being able to open up that highway and, and, and you know, have traffic safely running down without having to, you know, call for five or six um, trucks to bring salt because they've uh, put 30,000 gallons or they put copious amounts of water down. So all things that we need to look at. But he sits there and they go through, they get done. Um, as you can see, one of the points that I, I like to also bring out when, when people are, are using encapsulator agent um, is that when he's going through, you look, he's not constantly flowing water. He, I know when I was in, in, you know, many firefighters, they sit there and they get their nozzle, you know, we got our rookies out there and they open up the nozzle and they, I mean, shoot, it's five, six, seven, 800 gallons of water before they shut the nozzle off. And when you sat there and you watch him, he's got a TKO nozzle, again, adjustable from a half, one, 3%, 20 gallons per minute. And he is opening and closing the nozzle as he sits there and he knocks the fire down. Once all the fire is knocked down, um, he sits there and he goes and he shuts it off. As he swept across the roof, you notice he hit the sunroof, a little bit of magnesium. Now he's going to come down. He's going to sit there and he's going to hit it. Um, he broke it up and that's why you saw kind of flash away on him, but uh, he broke the chunks up, but again, there was really no explosions shooting those flammable sparks way up into the air or burning up turnout gear. We look at a class A material, just our regular wood pallets. Um, we will sit there and we, you know, we light them up. The pallets that are on the left side have been treated with uh, F500. And this is a good example of some of the burn back resistance that is also um, going to be provided when you sit there and start using an encapsulator agent. So we get those um, lit up. We're going to sit there. I'm going to move ahead a little bit. I'm going to turn this up because we'll see. So we're getting up to about 1100 degrees. So as you can see, I mean, we've got we've got uh, temperatures in excess of 1,100 degrees that are impinging on those pallets. So the amount of Radiant heat, the amount of heat that those pallets, once, they, once they've had that treatment, an encapsulator agent um, offers some, you know, some really, really good burn back resistance. 
speed it up here a little bit. Well, what kind of temperatures we got? I only had uh, 1100. Uh, I think I'm getting a 1300 now. Around 1100 max. No. So when he puts it out, I'm, I'm trying to speed it up because it's a long video. But as he goes ahead and he puts these out rather rapidly, again, once we put it out, we do still have to do our overhaul, um, our due diligence as firefighters go through, make sure we've extinguished everything. We do our overhaul. But we've taken from 1100 degrees down to 122 degrees just in a matter of seconds, being able to encapsulate. Um, some of the other things that we're going to see is that rapid heat reduction. You know, even though you have what appears to be steam, which it is not, um, it is a warm white mist, but it is not steam. So we're able to, you know, place our hands on it. One of the other things when I do some of my demos and I get some of that heavy char and I've extinguished with F500, you can actually, you know, take a break off a piece of that wood with that heavy char and you actually have um, a, a, a different, a totally different smell. Um, it's a clean smell. It's not going to be that burnt wood, that charcoal, that charred smell. It's actually a clean smell um, because again, we've helped reduce those toxins and those carcinogens. And then we take a torch, we sit there and we start to show how we can put the torch back onto um, the areas that we've just had burn and we can get it to glow. Um, we can get it to glow cherry red. Yeah, we can you know, get it to burn slightly, but once we pull the torch away, um, it will self extinguish. And then if we go over here to um, the other pallets that weren't, that were pre-treated. Yep. And again, these were the ones that were pre-treated before. And the same thing, while we can get them to um, start to start to burn, get cherry red, they'll start to burn. Um, but once the torch is pulled away, um, the fires go out because of that burn back of resistance, the properties that encapsulator agent will bring um, an offer when it's supplied. So I'm gonna go on to the next one here uh, is going to be a jet fuel fire. Control one of the things I wanna point out uh, for those in, of you that are very familiar with foam, use foam, you know that there's only three application techniques. The three applica application techniques are you rain it down, bank it in, or roll it on. Now, here we have a pit, uh, uh, a fire, that because there's nothing in back, there's really only two methods. You can either try raining it down or rolling it on. And when we start to look at how much foam, how much foam is it going to take? But yet with an encapsulator agent, you'll see he rapidly sweeps across and in a matter of seconds, he's reduced or eliminated about 80%, 90% of that fire. And now he's working on doing a couple of things. He's trying to cool the metal ring, the metal ring being an ignition source. And then he's working to uh, extinguish the, the fire. Um, so once he's had the fire out, um, he'll be able to take his glove off and go up and touch that metal ring. Um, he's cooled it down below the auto ignition temperature. But the question I'm going to ask is, how many gallons of foam do you think it would have taken to extinguish the same fire? I mean, if you were raining it down, you're going to have to rain it down long enough until it can get a footprint in and start to, you know, cool off an area and start to spread or it's either you build it up in front of the pit and then you and you roll it on. But how much foam do you think it would have taken? You know, here we're using a 100 or 95 gallon per minute nozzle, 3% of F500 and they had that fire extinguished in a matter of seconds. 
And when we sit there, we start looking at some of the new fluorine free or the non fluorinated foams that are being introduced. The problem becomes is they need anywhere from three times or more amount of concentrate than you do with the current foams. So what does that do to your cost? The other thing I'm going to throw out there when you sit there and you start looking at some of our new fluorinated foams before you make a purchase, please look at the SDS. Um, because in many cases, and, and thanks to some states that require more stringent re reporting of toxics and, and some chemicals, um, you're going to see that in some of these fluorinated fluorine free foams. Um, they're, yeah, getting rid of the PFOS and the PFOAs, but we're changing it out with things that are teratogens and mutagens and, and you know, they cause birth defects or other health problems. So we're getting rid of one and exchanging for another. So we need to kind of figure out, you know, if that's the way we want to go. When we sit there and we start looking at an encapsulator agent, again, non-corrosive, tox, non-toxic, um, basically able to be used on all fires that foams are not able to be used on. So it's a, it's a unique um, extinguishing agent because of all the things it's able to do with the rapid cooling, the reduction of the toxins um, up by 98.6%. Uh, 90, Your long-term burn back resistance as we saw with those pallets. Um, we don't work with creating a blanket because we're not a foam. And it's a multi-class extinguishing agent. So when we talk about that rapid cooling and how does it work, how is it able to do that rapid cooling without creating that scalding steam that we see? And the reason is, is because we change the mechanism of how a water droplet is able to cool, where water turns into steam okay, and can cause steam burns. Okay, we put that skin on the surface of the water droplet that we saw earlier. And by putting that skin on the surface, what happens is it helps drive the heat interior to the water droplet. And those millions and millions of spherical micelles that are inside of each and every water droplet, they rapidly absorb the heat and then slowly release it into the water around them. And in doing, and through that process, there is no steam created. Yeah, you see that mist, that warm white, um, but again, it is not steam. This is a video I mentioned earlier, um, showing the thermal imaging. Um, it's, it gives you a better idea and example. Um, you'll start to see our temperatures in excess of that 1200 degrees, but watch how rapidly, watch how rapidly those temperatures drop. I mean, in a matter of seconds. He's taken it from 1,200 degrees, and, and you know we've dropped them down considerably. So it gives you a really good idea with this visual uh, thermal imaging, just how effective and how efficient encapsulator agent in your water stream is when it comes to being able to extinguish and cool these these metal surfaces and when we look at it your metal surfaces especially if you're around flammable liquids or gases can be an ignition source or a reignition source so if we can sit there and in in the process of putting a car fire out um, we can sit there and we can we can actually be and have an effect on um, being able to cool and prevent those reignitions from occurring. So here we've taken a, a propane torch or a, a blow torch, um, a settling torch. Uh, we've heated up uh, to 1200 and, and degrees and, and with a little two and a half gallon of water extinguisher mixed with a 3%. Um, they rapidly are able to cool that metal to a point where he's going to be able to touch it. Um, he can put his hand on it. And he, that was just with a, a few seconds of application. Um, again, not something you'll do with just plain water. So 
when we sit there and we talk about what are the benefits, okay, well, again, if we've been able to rapidly cool, we need less water, okay? We're gonna have less damage, less time operating on the highway because we can turn that vehicle now over to the towing company much quicker and we need less resources. You, you may not need that second or you may not need that third pumper or if you're out in a more rural area, you may not need that tender. Uh, shuttling water to you. Again, all wear and tear on vehicles that uh, you can hopefully reduce. So not only that, but if we're using less water, again, the environmental impact, you know, that you're going to have being able to do that, the need to possibly have, you know, the highway department come down and have to do, a, you know, a, a major road cleanup. Um, if there's fuels involved, what do you currently use to take care of your fuels and things like that when you're doing um, some of your extrications? We'll talk about that as we continue on. But the toxin reductions, I've mentioned all through the presentation, we're exposing ourselves to who knows what when we sit in there and we start uh, responding to our accidents on the highway. What's being released in some of the new vehicles as far as, you know, the, the materials that they use to make the seats or the, the roof liners or other parts of the vehicle? When they burn, what kind of toxins are they releasing? Um, so when we sit there and start looking at the ability of an encapsulator agent to interfere and to um, start absorbing and improving that air quality, uh, we have instances where, you know, F500 can reduce your cancer causing toxins and sit by up to 98.6%, which is huge. Um, it's, it makes a huge difference in providing that safety when we're looking at fighting fires. Um, this video is, is again, a pile of tires. We, we have some good heavy black smoke taking place. You'll see as he sits there and he goes through and he starts making an attack, the first thing he does is he sprays off to the side to make sure he's got um, the F500 solution in the stream. But now I stop here and I ask the question. I still see a lot of fire. Where's the smoke? Okay, that ability to start working and start encapsulating, interfering with that free rad those free radicals, okay, those toxins. Okay, where's the smoke? And this is showing you the effectiveness of, of the encapsulator agent as he's fighting this fire. And once he's gotten to that point where he's starting to attack the fire and he's eliminated that black smoke. And again, you see that white mist coming off there. That's not steam. Um, if you were to take your glove off and stick your hand into that, that mist, um, it'd be no hotter than a shower. So he's going through. As I mentioned earlier, um, just because you put the fire out, you still need to do your overhaul. So he's basically separated the tires out. And he did a little bit more cooling. He did his overhaul. So when we sit there, we talk about, you know, the, the percentages, those toxin reductions. And you may ask, you know, hey, where did it come from? Well, it came from a Clemson University test. Um, where they tested um, F500 and they used an inverted glass funnel. And they were looking at three things. They were looking at light transmission through the smoke column. They were looking at the buildup of smoke or the buildup of soot on the, on the sides and the walls of the uh, funnel. And, th and then they were looking at the toxicity of that soot. And they ran the test using water and then they redid it you know, the second series of tests using a 3% solution of F500 encapsulator agent. And these are the results came from that study. A 68% reduction in or increase in visibility. So when you sit there and you start looking at, you know, those car fires, that white smoke, that black smoke turning white, well, we're increasing, we're helping actually increase visibility because we're getting rid of and reducing the soot and the toxins. The soot was reduced by 97%, but the toxicity by 98.6%. And when we sit there and we start looking at some of the excerpts, 
Um, you know, the excerpt one from it suggests that the interruption of the vapor phase combustion possibly uh, by inhibiting the radical essence in the soot particles. So where those carcinogens are forming, uh, where they, they where they join together, um, we're interfering with that. And then again, toluene, uh, the fire extinguisher 500 produced smoke and combustion byproducts that were 98.6% less toxic than compounds released from untreated fires. And we're going to see um, as we go through and we talk a little bit more about even lithium ion batteries um, and things like that, uh, how encapsulator agent reduces the toxins from those types of fires as well. The testing that was done uh, with benzene, um, these were done in, in looking at the exposure to firefighters and with their inhaled breath. And these were uh, a test that was done uh, by the NFP, uh, no, um, NIOSH, excuse me, uh, with Dr. Fent. And what they were doing is they were looking at, you know, baseline readings and they were looking at a civilian non-smoker and they were looking at the median average. Uh, it was 0.8 parts per billion of benzene. And, and they looked at a person that smoked and they were about five parts per billion. And then a firefighter, the average was 20 to 30 parts per billion. And then when he sat there and they, they, put them into a exposed, you know, um, exposure. They sat there and they, they watched how much higher um, the levels went. And they, you know, we see that, you know, we're at that pre-level at 20 to 30, the post levels went up close to 80. Um, so if you look there in the middle, um, they're being exposed to a fire. Um, and then one hour afterwards, they're back down in that 44 to 54 parts per billion. And that's our exposure when we sit there and we go into a, a regular house fire or some other types of fires that we might be exposed to. Um, even though we're fully clothed with our turnout gear, uh, we have our hoods on, um, we're still absorbing these benzenes and these toxins through our skin. Um, you know, so if we're able to use an encapsulator agent in our water stream and reduce them before we become exposed to them, uh, before we make our entries, uh, it's going to greatly reduce the amount of toxins that we're going to be absorbing in our skin while we're fighting these types of fires. And if we're absorbing less because we're reducing them using an encapsulator agent, you know, we're reducing our risk to cancers. We're improving our health. Um, as well as we're improving the environment because we're not going to have as much runoff. The Clemson study showed the visibility and safety all around. And when it says safety all around, the point I want to point out here is let's take this again and talk about that structure fire, that house fire. And I know this is supposed to be about, you know, our, our auto accidents, but, you know, if we take and we look at um, an, a structure fire where we're being exposed, um, normally, we like to get into the structure and, and find the source or the spot of the fire, hit it, <coughs> excuse me, because we don't want to interrupt those thermals, as we call them, because, you know, we'll change those thermals and, and cause that heat to come down and possibly burn some firefighters. Well, now we put an encapsulator agent in, in the stream. And we go in and we start as soon as we kick open the door and we have all that black smoke run, uh, pull, pouring out the door. How about now we go in with a, a fog pattern, a tight fog pattern. We start spraying around the ceiling, knocking down that smoke, reducing those soot and the toxins. We start reducing those temperatures. What if there's a victim inside that structure? What do you think that's doing for him or, or her? If it's a child, what kind of conditions would it be if you waited and created the steam when you got to the seat of the fire versus encapsulating, reducing the soot and the toxins, improving your visibility, reducing the temperatures without creating steam. You know, you're totally changing the conditions. So it's not only working on those car fires, also on our, our structure fires. But F500 is an eco-friendly, um, it is biodegradable, non-corrosive. There's no PFOS and PFOAs, which are the main uh, thing that people are so worried about being exposed to right now. So it's a very uh, useful multi-class extinguishing agent with no harmful chemicals. And this is just a real quick slide that shows, you know, 
all the different areas and, and you know, the, the occupational cancers that firefighters are battling because of their exposure um, to the PFOS or because of the, you know, the different types of toxins. I mean, our houses, you know, you look at 40 years ago, the, what a house was made out of versus today. Um, and, you know, you, you start looking at how much faster they're burning. And it's because of all of the new synthetic materials um, that are being used in the construction of our homes. So it's making things harder and harder for us as far as, you know, the cancers that we're being exposed to, the carcinogens we're being exposed to when we sit there and we try to go in and extinguish these fires. Some of the other benefits are if we're not using as much water, you're going to have less soil contamination. We're not going to be staying into the environment. We're not one of those forever chemicals. So there's going to be no contamination of water. Uh, we're not going to be, you know, contaminating wildlife. And the cleanup costs, the savings. And I, I can give you some, you know, examples where, you know, the savings and the cleanup cost can be astronomical. Um, and your community health. So we're going to talk here, you know, we've seen the TKO nozzle. Um, again, as I mentioned, it's a little two liter bottle. Um, it's 20 gallons per minute. It's adjustable from a half one and 3% at uh, 100 PSI. Um, it's a great tool when you're sitting there and you're dealing with maybe a, a you know, a brush fire, small little brush fire, or um, you're dealing with your car fires or some small fires, but there's very uh, many uses um, for this dazzle. Again, here we have it. Hazard One of the things, technology. again, I'm pointing out, black smoke turning white. You know, he's using all these different classes. He's got the fuel, he's got the magnesium, he's got the plastic, he's got the interior. But again, he's not constantly flowing water. He's, he's going to, as you see him, as he starts coming around, he, he's going to have it shut off. So he flows the water, he knocks down the fire, he cools the steel a little bit, he comes back on this side, sprays a little bit. But look how little water he has on around the vehicle. very 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 little runoff as after he's extinguished this this fire so it shows the versatility of the agent and being able to rapidly cool rapidly extinguish this fire using very little water i mean 20 gallons per minute if you time that he's probably only used oh wow i would say maybe 30 30 gallons of water because I know he has, I don't even think that much because I don't think he's flowed water for a full minute. So as he does his overhaul, I mean, we'll add that in there, but I mean, it just shows the ability of these encapsulator agents to knock down the fire using much less water and being much more effective. Another uh, tool that uh, most firefighters carry is a fire extinguisher. Um, I carry two of these fire extinguishers in my vehicle as I travel. And, you know, if I were to come across a car fire, I feel pretty confident that with five gallons of water, I can do a pretty good knockdown. Um, I might not be able to put out the magnesium, but I figure the class A materials um, that are in the car fire, or if it's an engine compartment or something that's just starting, I feel pretty confident that with five gallons of water, I could put a fire out. Um, and again, as you use the product you become familiar with the product uh, and how to apply you will have the same results the knockdown power is just absolutely amazing and one of the things that we've come up with or uh, started to put on those is the european water mist hose uh, which gives a nice uh, a sprinkler pattern um, it works very well um, i've had uh, a few demos with it and uh, it, it's very very impressive um, it being able to give you a good spray pattern uh, rather than just a straight stream. And one of the things when you learn and as you work with and, and you um, start to uh, use F500 extinguishing agent, you're going to see that the spray pattern and the droplet size is going to be very important. Um, the smaller the droplets, the more effective it is at cooling and extinguishing. 
So one of the things that, you know, we uh, want to make sure because we, through different uh, trainings have found uh, in, in, and it comes, it can become a problem is the limitations and making sure you have the correct equipment um, when you're sitting there and you're doing it. And when we start talking about it, um, when you sit there and you're looking at foam proportioners that might be on your apparatus, your foam cells, you know, is it a class A system or is it a class B system? Um, the thing is that you have to under, also understand is what's the maximum uh, GPM flow at 1%. What's the maximum flow at 3%. And the reason why you need to know some of these things is because if you can only get 95 gallons per minute at 3% and you are trying to flow 125 gallons per minute, you're not getting 3%. So you need to make certain that you're, you know, you are familiar with your equipment. When you start looking at using an inline eductor, you know, what's the gallonage of the eductor? Is it a 60, a 95, a 125? Um, because it's important that you match the nozzle to the eductor. If you are using a 95 GPM eductor and a 125 uh, GPM nozzle, you're not going to be working. It's not going to educt. You have to match the two together. Um, the other thing is, is what's the um, uh, GPM or what's the PSI that you need to your eductor? In most cases, you need 200 PSI at the eductor um, to get it to work. And then you need to watch how much hose you have from the eductor to the nozzle. Um, so, you know, all of these things need to come into play and we need to be familiar with the equipment so that we don't have issues or we don't have problems. When we try to add encapsulator agent, because if you're fighting a fire that needs 3%, and as I said earlier, if you've got a system that, you know, is going to give you 95 gallons per minute max at 3%, and you're trying to flow a higher percentage, and you're not getting 3%, you may not get the results that you're looking for, or that you may see in videos, or that we may tell you. So it's very important that we sit there, we match those up, and, and everything is working correctly. Now, some of the other things that we want to start to talk about when we deal with these accidents along the highway that um, we make available is throw and go. Um, we work with Amerisorb, and uh, it's a, a professional uh, product that uh, helps with the absorption of fuels. It's eco-friendly as well. Um, we're going to show a quick video, but it works hand in hand with F500, and you'll see and you'll hear when I play the video here, um, talking about it, how well it works hand in hand when we sit there and start talking about the spills on the roadways and, and, and alongside. So with that, let me get Hello, this. my name is Tim Johnson, and I'm the sales manager for a company called Amerisorb out of Olympia, Washington. We are the manufacturer of a Northwest premier product called Throw and Go, which is used as an absorbent to pick up fuel and oil spills in the roadways. Today, I wanna to demonstrate to you why our product is the product of choice for so many. First, I would like to place some gasoline in the bottom of this lid. You'll be able to see how quickly it wicks the gasoline into itself. Now I'm gonna put our product uphill from it. And peat moss has a strong positive charge on a cellular level for hydrocarbons. So it acts like a magnet. And once it's pulled the hydrocarbons and contaminants into the cell, it will not release it again into the environment. As you can see, throw and go is rapidly drinking that puddle of gas. It's wicking it uphill and it's sucking that puddle dry very rapidly. As you can see in a matter of about 30 seconds, our peat moss brought in all of that gas, wicked it uphill, and sucked that puddle dry. Next, I'm gonna show you the fire retardant and vapor suppressant nature of our peat moss. Because of the pri proprietary drying process that we use, our product acts as a wet blanket over flammable fuels and contaminants. Cover that with a fresh blanket of our peat. I'll put a torch directly on it. As you can see, 
that throw and go will not allow ignition to take place, even though there's a lot of gas underneath that. Next, I'm going to pull this back and get into some of the wet, gassy peat, and I'm going to light a small fire. And then just a little bit of peat moss sprinkled on immediately snuffs out the flame. A couple of huge safety factors there. Most of our first responders, the biggest risk that they have with a fuel spill is a spark igniting an explosive fire. They love the fact that once they put throw and go down over the fuel, now they don't have to worry about that. It simply cannot happen with our peat moss. Secondly, all of your fuels and oils give off a toxic vapor. Our throw and go holds those vapors down so workers don't have to breathe them while they're working around fuel and oil spills. Next, I'm going to demonstrate how our product works versus the leading kitty litter with used oil. I'm going to put a couple of pancakes of used oil on this pan. I'm going to use a leading kitty litter that is available at all your auto parts stores and still used by many for an oil dry. And on the other side, I'm going to reuse our peat moss that's already brought in fuel. So this is a second usage for throw and go. Now, if you've worked with this type of product, you know you have to sweep it around, push it around, do the kitty litter dance, whatever it takes to get this product to pick up. And because it's not a true absorbent, it's a lot of work and it doesn't work very well. This product is actually classified as an adsorbent, meaning the oils and fuels will only stick to the outside of the particles. They're not being brought into the cell. So wherever this ends up after you pick up a contaminant with it, it's going to recontaminate the environment called secondary contamination or leaching. The other issue with this type of product, if you read the back of the bag, it warns against silica dust, which is in all of your clay based kitty litter type products. Silica is carcinogenic, causes cancer. They warn you not to breathe the dust. Again, ours is all organic and natural, will not harm the environment, people or animals. Now the best part about our product, it's called throw and go because you can throw this down, go about your business in the work site or at an accident scene, come back 10 or 15 minutes later, it's done the absorbing for you. You don't have to sweep and work it, just shovel it up with a flat shovel. Your surface is going to look like that instead of like that because this is going to go after the oil on its own. It's going to ball it up like that, leaving the surface clean by comparison to this mess. Well, that's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. You can learn more about our environmentally friendly line of products by going to our website at amerisorb.com. Have a great day. Okay, so when we sit there and start looking at, you know, working hand in hand, let's go back and, and talk about, and, and we saw the properties and, and the uh, benefits of using a Amerisorb. The other thing is, is if you have a large fuel spill at an auto accident where you're trying to do an extrication, um, you could actually start out by using a F500 encapsulator agent to encapsulate the fuel. Um, you could take a reading with your LEL monitor, making sure that the reading is zero. Um, and let's say there's still some gas that's dripping out of the fuel tank. Now you can sit there and you throw down your Amerisorb and you can sit there and you can start using that to contain and, and trap that, Amer, uh, that, that leaking fuel yet. So um, that it's not going to cause an issue with your response responders that are extricating and, and try and get patients out of vehicles so Hello, we can work hand in hand with them the other thing that is a is is you know with in today's world is basically firefighters budgets um you know we're trying to do more and more with less money um less people the thing is is that you know, there is sources out there that can help with our budgets and in, in trying to do some cost recovery. Um, it's another one of the things that HCT can help with and, and get you information on here in the U.S. <coughs> Excuse me. But it can help you in, in being able to recover some of those costs that might be associated with your responses to these auto accidents um, along the highway. And again, we have a real quick video that will There's explain. Been a crash. People are hurt. Fluids are leaking. Traffic needs directing. 
As you arrive on the scene, your priority is safety, Yeah, the video don't have sound. The video's not playing? Without sound. Okay, let me try it again. Fluids are leaking. Traffic needs directing. As you arrive on the scene, your priority is safety, is care, better? and containment. The last thing on your mind is the cost of the call. Yes. But here's a question. Should your department have to pay for someone else's recklessness? If a city ordinance or county resolution says you're entitled to reimbursement, your department has a right to its money. And that's the problem. Do you have the time and the resources to chase it? We do. We're EF Recovery, one of the most experienced providers of billing services. Welcome to Response Recovery, a claims management program that recovers incident response dollars and gives them back to your department. With the Response Recovery Program, we have the infrastructure, insurance company relationships, and knowledge of the law to get you the money you deserve. Here's how it works. Using your fire reporting system, we locate and extract the MVA, obtain the incident report, and fill out all the incident paperwork. You approve the claim, we file it, and we pursue collection. If the claim is wrongfully denied, our team of experts pursues the insurance company and makes sure the claim gets paid. Submitting information to us is easy and the claims review process is fast and convenient. There are no minimums or special requirements and training is a snap thanks to our templates for manpower, consumables, and equipment that save you time. Best of all, you're in full control of the program. You determine who we speak to, the insurance company, the responsible party who caused the incident, or both. Our customer service is second to none. We use the maximum care, consideration, and professionalism, whether we're working with you, with insurance companies, or with residents in your community. We have safeguards to ensure accuracy and compliance, and we bill for all types of runs. So whatever incident your department responded to, we'll get to work on the reimbursement for it. If you're ready to recover the reimbursable expenses that you've earned, and you want to work with an experienced, seasoned partner, you want this flexible program. The Response Recovery Program from EF Recovery. Because your department deserves every dollar it's earned. And just as, you know, to expound on that is, you know, in many cases, our auto insurance is actually designed or set up um, to basically pay fire departments um, a cost um, if they're using agents or they're using materials um, to clean up spills and, and, and to clean up. Um, these costs are built into uh, everybody's insurance. Uh, car insurance as well as homeowners insurance so it's 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 something that you're paying for in your when you pay your your insurance that fire departments aren't utilizing um it would be like you know paying for health insurance and then getting sick and and paying the bill without using your insurance type of a thing so you know it, it's here's a funding stream that's available to the fire service and firefighters to help with their budgets um, so by all means, feel free to contact us for additional information on both the throw and go and on um, EF recovery. So let's, you know, kind of conclude here and, and, and get through and, and talk about that. And one of the things that I would like to stress is that F500 is not a replacement for foam. There is still a place for foam. Um, by all means, hopefully they do come up with a, a good quality uh, fluorine free foam. We need to understand the difference between an encapsulator agent, water, and foam. 
you know, your waters, we understand, we use it all the time, um, really are able to cool using steam, a water drop of somewhere in the area of about maybe three, if you're lucky, 5% of the water is used to extinguish the fire, the rest is running off. Um, our foam, if we look at the foam standard NFPA 11, and we go to Annex A11 of the standard, it's going to state that foam is not suitable for three-dimensional flowing, spraying fuel fires or, or gas fires. Okay, but what do we use on it? Because up to now, we haven't had anything else, or we didn't think we had anything else. We now have an encapsulator agent that works on those types of fires. So we work on all the types of fires, all the different classes of fires. Is that foam cannot, okay? So there is still a place for foam in the fire service. We just want to be another tool in your toolbox. So we hopefully, you know, you, you'll embrace the, the new innovative technology that encapsulator agent brings, you know, all the different uh, benefits that we brought, uh, brought to the market as far as the ability to reduce those soot and toxins, reduce the heat, no steam, um, able to encapsulate fuels, able to extinguish lithium ion batteries. Um, I mentioned the HF gas as we were going through and you know, there's also testing that was done on the HF gas. And while we showed you that Clemson report, there's also a report that shows that when we start getting into HF gas and some uh, the testing with lithium ion batteries, um, HF gas levels when they use plain water were like 250 to 2600 parts per million. Uh, when they used encapsulator agent into the water stream, the highest amount of HF gas that was released was like 35 or 37 parts per million. So it was greatly reduced. Um, as far as being able to reduce our exposure when dealing with lithium ion battery fires to that HF gas. Um, and it, it doesn't stop there. I mean, I mean, it's been used to neutralize sulfuric acid um, and, and other things. So the benefits that a encapsulator agent brings to the fire service is exponentially uh, changes the way we should be fighting fires today. Um, and with that, uh, I guess we can open up for questions. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yes, how you say we have a, one person that he put in the chat uh, talking about uh, something about fluorine free phones are better than fluorine phones in sun application. You less than normal phones. But how you explain, we are talking about that different technologies. Right? To understand that uh, you don't have to replace all your phone with this product. You have to understand how work this technology that you can use better and you have other kind of solutions uh, in, the, in the field, in, in the fire. Okay. Uh, if somebody want to open the microphone and make any comments or any question. Uh, yes, Graham Higgs from Australia. Jeff, uh, thanks, mate. That was, that was really interesting stuff. I have a question regarding uh, thermal runaway and really reignition. Have you ever had an experience where the batteries having been treated with F500 have reignited? Um, in all the testing that uh, that has been done where F500 has been used. There has not been a reported reignition of a lithium ion battery. Um, like I say, the ability, um, and when you sit there and, you know, we, we do uh, some of our, our, our test that reports that we see, um, when they've used F500, um, there's usually, uh, with an example of one test that was done, um, they, they did two different batteries, one using 50 liters of, of just plain water, and then another one uh, using two liter solution of F500. Um, with the plain water, they were unable to extinguish the battery with 50 liters. Um, when they sat there and they used the 2% solution of F500, um, they again allowed the battery going to thermal runaway. They did like a five second blast, a five second burst of, of F500 solution. 
Um, it knocked down the fire um, and uh, they uh, gave it a, a period of, of a few seconds or a minute and, and, and they allowed to see what happened. Um, it did start to develop some heat and some flame again. They gave it another five second blast. Um, at that, it was able to extinguish the batteries. Um, after again, a period of time, there was no reignition. Um, they gave it a third blast. Uh, monitoring the temperatures, they watched the temperatures that were continuing to fall. Um, and they gave it a, a fourth blast, another five second blast it was a fourth uh, as a fourth blast and, and then continued to monitor the battery, watching the temperatures continually drop. Um, so no, we haven't had again, the ability of the encapsulator agent is doing a couple things. One, it's again, in, encapsulating that flammable electrolyte, which is going to be a source because of the heat um, that could reignite the electrolytes and, and get things burning again. So we're encapsulating that electrolyte, reducing the flammable hazard and reducing the heat that still might be in the batteries from reigniting that electrolyte and, and continuing the propagation of, of that lithium ion battery burning. Um, so we work on those multiple aspects and being able to cool, extinguish, and, and encapsulate the fuels, um, being so so we're able to extinguish them and and no reignitions. Here, Jeff, I, I share this uh, this video that you can see when apply the A500, the temperature down, and um, when I move forward, yes you can see how the temperature starts to down and with the more time you pass start to cool more jeff can uh it's me again sorry being yeah. nagged but can uh can that sprinkler system or the suppression system be triggered uh after uh, detecting vapors rather than the uh the heat uh issue where it might be too late to save some something yeah systems systems could be designed where if it started to detect some of the off gassing before a battery goes into thermal runaway um yeah they've they've got detection systems out there that could be used in that and then uh misting systems could be set off um, so that they can start to cool the battery and uh, hopefully prevent it from ever going into um, thermal runaway or, you know, causing a fire. So, Jeff, uh, this is Mike. Let me throw a few things in here. Okay. Uh, on that um, project with Evergy where we're doing the lithium ion battery energy storage system fire protection, the detection is actually tied into the battery management system. And so we're getting continuous feeds from every rack as to what the temperatures are. And then there's three settings. The first setting, if it gets up to a certain temperature, it sets off an alarm and notifies somebody that we're at this temperature. And that's a temperature that's above operating, but way below where you actually get a thermal runaway. That would allow somebody to possibly put eyes on it, um, take a closer look, maybe shut that rack down and prevent the fire in the first place. Then there's a second level that's kind of like, let's clear the room. And then the third level when they actually uh, experience the off gassing. So we're tied to the battery management system, but you could tie to a, a, a gas detection meter that as soon as you get the off gas, you detect it, then you can start your suppression system. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Jeff, we have other question from Gregory. Uh, is what if any effect does A500 have on propane vapors? Um, being an encapsulator agent, uh, we can, and um, I, again, with some of my rural departments that um, have and deal with propane tanks, um, I've always, you know, let them know that if they are using F500 and by chance are trying to uh, cool a propane tank that may have some fire impinging on it or maybe have a line that's broken and is burning, um, if they were to accidentally kind of spray up, they will put that propane fire out. 
Um, now, the thing is, is you have those vapors, as you're mentioning, um, continue to flow 3% F500, and it will encapsulate those vapors, preventing them from finding an ignition source, um, allowing firefighters, while it's still flowing, to go up and shut the valve off. But yes, we will encapsulate those propane vapors. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, I have other question. Is that we have a detection and extinguishing system in Australia using A500 with 24 hour monitoring? Mr. Hutchinson, you want to explain this, please? Hi, uh, yes, um, Ian Hutchison here, Scott, come from Scotland, but living in Australia. We um, have a system called, well, you probably know it, called Fire Rover, and we um, monitor and um, fight fires in material recycling facilities to start with, moving on to other facilities as we sort of grow the business. Uh, thermal grade cameras that pick up HDMI, or well, HD, um, video and also thermal um, heat chasing video. And as soon as an alarm is detected, so the very early stages of any type of fire, it picks up a heat source. It then gets sent to the monitoring company who then look at it and decide whether it's a false alarm, you know, somebody smoking, a, a forklift gone past, anything like that. If it isn't a, a, a false alarm, then the mixture of um, water and F500 is uh, activated using nitrogen gas as a propellant. So for instance, for a, a large, you know, um, 50 by 50 meter warehouse, we would only have 2000 liters of water on standby with the equivalent amount of F500. So we actually brought that into Australia and we have sold a few already and we are going to be taking it into aviation, into the mining industry, into the chemical and petrochemical industries uh, and various other issues. So we big fan of the F500, know exactly what it can do. And um, um, myself and Chris Andel, who's on this, on this chat, are, are selling it like it's uh, going out of fashion. You know, we really are keen and know of its benefits and really excited about their future with it. Yeah, thank, you for thank you for information. Uh, somebody want to open the microphone and make any question? Because we don't have any question in the chat, Jeff. Okay. I've, I've actually got one other question, Ian okay. again from Australia. We were speaking to a consultant who said that they were using F500 in the fire brigade, but it left the road surface after sort of cleanup, um, extremely slippery, as in when there was a rain rainfall, maybe a day or two days later, that particular part of the road became slippery. Is that an issue that's been identified anywhere else? That's the first I've heard of, of that happening. Um, was it what what was the fuel that they were using? Um, Oh look, it was it was just a road a road traffic accident that they had, and this has come sort of second third hand from the fire brigade to a consultant to ourselves. So whether it's accurate or not, I'm not 100 certain, but it was certainly mentioned that the road became slippy after they'd used the F500 encapsulating technology. So I'll certainly check that up again and, and maybe email you guys separately regarding that once I get some more information. Yes, please do. Um, I know in, in the experiences that I've had with it, um, where I've used, um, because again, with my fire background, many times when, like say, you go out on a fuel spill, diesel, um, diesel can be very, very slippery. Um, and I know when I've used F500 to wash down or to encapsulate diesel fuel, um, it's, re it's actually reduced uh, the slipperiness of the of the diesel fuel uh, considerably, um, but I have not heard of um, 
and again, I'm now that you've meant, meant, um, said said that, I, I think I'm going to uh, have to do some of my own research on that. But uh, I've not heard of it creating a slippery condition uh, days later at when, in the rain. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have an invitation, Jay, for you to go to Mexico. They want, to make a, they want to make a demo. But you, have to, you have to practice your Spanish. Ah. Say this excellent presentation. It's very clear all, all the information. Uh, uh, again, uh, I'd like to thank you all for being present for the questions, uh, for your for your inf information um, that you shared with us in, in some instances. I, again, the ability of an encapsulator agent and how we're able to transform the fire service um, is, is I, mean, I mean, it it's changing the way we should be doing things just as the technology is changing the, the fires and the types of things that we're experiencing. Um, so in the 21st century, we should be looking at 21st century extinguishing agents. Um, we know uh, that in many instances, you know, some things and tactics that we have been using haven't worked. So it's, it's time that we sit there and we open up and we start looking at what's new in the world to fight 21st century fires. And hopefully I was able to give you some insight in Encapsulator Agent, how it works, how it can transform fires, how it can make our profession safer. Um, how it can reduce our uh, risk of, of cancer and exposures to carcinogens and toxins. Um, and with that, again, once you uh, get the presentation that uh, we have tonight, uh, when, when Hernan shares it to you, if you have some questions that come up, by all means, you know, please email us, share them, uh, info at hct-world.com. Um, we'll make certain that we get those questions answer for, answered for you. But again, thank you. Um, it's been my pleasure and I look forward to our next webinar or where we get to, to, to meet again and, and hopefully get some more um, information out about fires and, and things that F500 will work on. Thank you and have a good morning, evening, night, uh, wherever you may be from. I appreciate you, thank you. <laughs>